Hi, welcome to another Opta Planner video. This time we're going to look at uh, using a decision table inside Opta Planner uh, to define the score of the, the, the planning problem. So um, uh, Opta Planner optimizes a planning problem. And in this case, we're going to look at the cloud balancing problem again, uh, where we have to assign processes uh, to computers. And we're going to use a decision table to uh, define some of the constraints. This means that we can actually add additional soft constraints uh, or change an existing one or, or remove existing one by simply editing the decision table. And the decision table, as you can see, is uh, an XLS file, an Excel file, which you can open with Excel or, or LibreOffice. Um, now let's take a look at the, uh, the planning problem. So the planning problem is assigning processes to computers. And you can see we he here we have uh, a number of processes. We have nine processes and we have three computers. And we have, and for example, we've assigned four of those processes to computer zero. Let me show all four, these four processes. And you can see that they require a number of CPU power each, some memory and some network bandwidth each. And you can see that if we count, uh, if we sum their requirements, we have um, enough uh, CPU power uh, on this machine. Uh, even though, so the machine has 24 gigahertz of CPU power and the, the, require, and the processes require eight gigahertz in total. And the same for memory and the same for network bandwidth. Um, so these are three hard constraints and these three hard constraints um, have, uh, are still in there. Um, they're still being used. Uh, but there's also in the normal example, there's a soft constraint where we look at the maintenance fee and we try to shut down computers. But in this case, uh, I've disabled that soft constraint. And so instead, uh, we'll actually define other soft constraints and we'll use the decision table to do that. So um, in this case, we presume we don't have to pay any maintenance fee for the computers uh, and we so and we computers are sitting there so we can we will try to use them as optimally as possible. And uh, let's take a look at what we have as soft constraints. So there, as you can see, I have to find them in the in this decision table. And the first one is that if uh, we have uh, a risk for out of a memory on a certain machine, then we will have a soft impact of a minus 100. So uh, which is pretty high soft impact actually, because all the others, as you can see, have have lower impacts. Um, so what happens here is. Um, if we have a certain machine, a certain computer, where the free memory is less than two gigabytes of free memory, then uh, we we will have this. We will the, the score basically will go down with one minus one hundred. So if um, Opta Planner finds a solution uh, and uh, it violates these constraints one or multiple times, it will have this impact on its score, and so it will try to avoid that to get to find solutions with a better score. Uh, the second rule is actually uh, is it the healthy rule. So if we have between if we have at least two gigabytes of memory, free memory, and at most eight, then we have no we have zero score impact. Uh, you ca we can actually remove this line. Uh, it's actually better to, re to remove it. But for clarity, I've uh, I've added it here so you can see that starting from eight gigabytes of memory, that we are actually adding our other rules. So um, if we have eight gigabytes of free memory, well, and that's 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 not bad in, in, in itself, but if you have eight gigabytes of free memory and we have, uh, and so that memory is unused, but we have no CPU or no network bandwidth available on that machine, that means that if new processes come into the system, which we need to schedule, we cannot schedule it to that machine because that machine, although it has a lot of free memory, doesn't have any of the other uh, two resources available. So it can't, it will have a tough time hosting any additional processes. Uh, so we want, so we paid for that memory was, uh, at some point. So we want to use that memory as efficiently as possible. So we want to make sure that um, if, uh, if new processes come in, they can actually be hosted on that machine. So um, if we have eight gigabytes of memory or more uh, free on a machine, but we have less than four uh, CPU power available on that machine, then we're going to lose 10 points. Um, if we have uh, the same case, but if we have uh, at least four, giga uh, four gigahertz of CPU power available, but less than eight gigahertz, um, this is still not that good because a, a big process that requires five gig gigabytes of 
uh, five gigahertz of CPU power. We cannot schedule this on, on this machine if it violates this constraint. So then we're going to punish this again. But this time it's a lot less. It's only minus one. So it's 10 times less. So it's uh, uh, less bad. Now, um, the same. so we do the same for network bandwidth, where we say if we have a machine that has eight gigabytes of free memory, but less than four uh, gigabytes of network bandwidth, then we're going to also minus 10, and uh, similarly for the last constraint. Now for the record, uh, it is possible that a machine violates both this, uh, both the new, the, no, the these two uh, lines. So it's possible that um, a machine has 8 gigabytes of free memory, but no CPU and no network bandwidth, and then it's going to suffer uh, twice. So it's going to have a score of minus 20, right? Okay. Now uh, let's take a look at uh, what the result of this, this thing is. So let's uh, take our example again. Let's take a big data set with, well, not a big data set, uh, actually still a small one with, with 100 computers and 300 processes. Let's uh, start solving this. And as you can see, let's give it a little bit more time. You can actually see the score here at the bottom and it's finding a better and better solution, as you can see. Now, let's take a look at what's it do, what's it's doing. Well, um, if you remember, uh, first of all, all the hard constraints are met. There's enough CPU, power, memory, and network bandwidth for all of the uh, processes, as you can see, nothing is red. And second of all, it's uh, first, uh, primary probably looking at that, uh, that constraint where we say, um, uh, let me show you again the constraint where we say risk for out of memory, right? So as we can actually look, if you actually look into to the list, you'll see that um, on all the machines, as if you look into this list, there's at least uh, none have less than two gigabytes free. So uh, uh, free, yeah. So for example, this machine has uh, six gigabytes free. Um, and so forth, right? So you can see this machine has two gigabytes free, but two is not less than two, so that's fine. Um, you can also see some computers are not used. Um, actually, all the computers which have just two gigabytes of, of memory are not used. That's actually logical, because as soon as you schedule a, a process on that, which uses at least one gigabyte in, in this model, um, then you'll see that there's only one gigabyte free, so it will violate this constraint, this soft constraint, and are, as a result of which, um, uh, OptoPlanner will avoid that because it has already, as you can see here, found a better solution where it doesn't lose 100 points. In fact, it only loses one, uh, six points in this case, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the other constraints, the other constraints were, okay, if we have f uh, free room um, of at least eight gigabytes, then we want some free room of CPU and network bandwidth. And if you look at these cases, we actually see that this is the case. So here we have a lot of um, uh, free uh, RAM. You can see there's actually quite a, a lot of free of the other resources too. Um, let's take a look further here. This one is, it does not have eight gigabytes of free memory left, so it's not trying to to, to do that in this this case. Uh, but cases where we do have this, as you can see, we're trying to open a, a lot of gap here. So that means that if new processes come into the system, we can likely schedule them on machine 31. Similar here for machine 38 and so forth. Okay. Now. Uh, let's stop this, and we have a score of minus four. And I'll put this at the side, all right? Because now it's time to actually uh, change the rules. Let's change the rules of the game. Now, if you look at the, the solutions, there's one thing that bothers me. Uh, we don't risk an out-of-memory error anymore because we leave one uh, gigabyte of, of memory just just in case something uh, some some process there uses uh, far more than it actually said it would. Um, now, um, but we do have these cases where the network bandwidth is being fully used, right? So we have actually have quite a few cases where it's being used all uh, all completely. Now, that, that means that there are there is a risk that some people uh, who come to the server don't actually uh, uh, mean, mean uh, that they go out of um, out of time, right? So um, that some uh, certain requests go out of time. So let's take a look of adding a constraint for that. So I'm going to add two constraints, right? Uh, one is risk for out of CPU, and the other one is risk for out of network, uh, right? Bandwidth. So let's take a look. Oh, let's make it a little bit more prettier. Uh, all right, let's remove the borders, yeah, uh, over here too. And um, 
let's take a look. What do we need to do? Well, if the CPU is less than 2, then we have a problem, and the problem is minus 50. Um, right, okay. Um, and then if for network bandwidth, if we have less than 2 uh, gigabytes of network bandwidth, then we're going to do minus 100. So I, I keep messing with this border. So let's fix it. Okay, great. So we've just added these two rules. And let's take a look what the impact of those two rules is. Let me just, uh, oh, that's not what I wanted. It was what I wanted. Let me just boot the application again. So on the left, we have the application which I ran last time. And so we started the application again. And here we go. We loaded the same data set. We're going to solve it. And we see that the score actually starts out a lot higher, right? Um, so uh, this means uh, this is because, of course, we added constraints. We made it harder to find a good solution. Uh, so it's natural that we, we see a reflection of this in, in, the, in, the, in the score, actually. Um, and you, but if you look at the, the, the solution, so let me just do that here. Oh, that here. Okay. So let's take a look. Take a look. So um, what we notice here is that um, now it's actually making sure that on each of these computers, there is uh, some CPU and some network, network bandwidth available too, right? Um, you can see that in, in that in most cases it succeeds in this. We've and we've basically effectively lowered the the, the maximum um, uh, resource of e of each resource type on each, every computer, right? So the, the maximum CPU, the maximum memory, and so forth. We've actually effect effectively lowered uh, lowered that. Although uh, you can see that if you look at the score, we still probably have two cases where uh, it's not succeeding in doing that. So there's probably still two cases where we actually use the full amount of uh, network bandwidth or something like that. Uh, let me just see if I can find them. Um, I don't immediately see them, but they're definitely in here somewhere. So, um, okay. Um, so, uh, and about the, the other thing we can see, of course, is that uh, this is we get a different solution, right? So this time we don't have a lot of space left on the, on this first machine. Uh, this is because we, we need to reserve more spaces on the other machines to get this uh, get this extra network bandwidth and so forth. Um, but um, it is it is trying to load balance as much as more. So uh, it depends, of course, on the user. Um, what he wants, right? What is the better solution for his planning problem? Um, we can ignore the score. It's just a matter of getting the lowest, I mean, the best score. Uh, but um, we cannot compare the score between these two, two cases because uh, they use different rules, right? Okay. Um, yeah, let's stop this. Right. So how did we implement this? Let's just take a look at the techni technical side behind this. So the first thing is, um, we have, so we, of course we have this, this Excel file. The first thing is we, uh, in our uh, solver configuration, we added our original rules, uh, wherever that's able to original soft constraint. And then we added a score DRL for this XSL file too. Um, so we can just add it directly there as an XSL file. Uh, actually in the new version of Auto Planner, we will actually also have support to add uh, a full file path in there. If you want this to, be, for example, put this on the desktop and, and allow them to just change that. Um, it does have, uh, for portability, it's not that a good way to do it. Um, but for experiments and proof of concepts, it's a useful way. Okay, so we just add XSL file. Okay, great. Um, and then if you look into the XSL, uh, XSL, so and what's also different is, so I've changed the rules a bit and I've added what we call a cloud computer usage object which basically just uh, encapsulates the amount of free memory, free CPU power, and free network bandwidth for each of the, com for uh, for every computer. So there's one per computer, a cloud computer usage. Okay, now let's take a look at the Excel file. Now, if you look at the Excel file, um, this, this might not seem that there is a lot of technical stuff behind this, but there actually is, if you actually show the, um, the things which you don't want users to change or uh, to see actually. So what we have here is we say, okay, it's a rule set. Uh, we say the package name. We do some imports of the classes that we're going to use. Uh, we can do some notes, of course, right? And then we have this rule table. And for the record, you can actually have multiple rule tables. 
Um, and in the rule table, I've said, okay, I have a number of conditions. So each of these conditions. So if a for the record, if a cell is empty, then it doesn't count, right? So this, this condition is not added. But you can see here, I have, uh, for example, in this case, the two is then put into this condition. So the, uh, so the condition starts with looking at first at uh, what class do I apply on, so on the computer usage. And then it says, okay, the free memory, which is one of the properties, needs to be less than uh, a parameter. And in this case, the parameter is two, okay? So, and the same happens uh, for the other constraints where we're just going to check if it's, uh, if it's uh, for example, um, uh, if it's uh, memory at least, and we're going to check if it's small or equal to the parameter. So in this case, if it's small or equal to two, or if it's small or equal to eight, right? Now, if um, if if such a rule matches, so each of these uh, rows becomes a single rule, right? Now, if one of these rules matches, so this is the left hand side, then the right hand side, which is the action, gets uh, executed, and here we just say, okay. Um, there is a soft constraint match and we're going to remove, uh, we're going to add that parameter basically. So we're going to remove 100 points here, remove 10 points here and so forth, right? Um, so um, this is basically the, the, the technical side behind it, right? So again, if we, before we send this to the users, we hide this part, uh, right? And we tell them, okay, you can change this part. Now, decision tables is just one way you could allow your users to change um, your your soft your rules right your soft or your hard rules and many other ways you can do this you can build your own GUI where which you use to generate the rules or you can use uh, rules workbench and so forth um, you can even use uh, other rules technologies such as rules scorecards which you should not uh, uh, confuse with actual score um, thing uh, the score uh, calculation which we have here um, but um, so there's a lot of there's a number of things you can do there and they all integrate nicely because um, yeah anything we can do in the rules you can actually use in opt planner right um, and of course if you don't like the rules you can still use uh, 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 plain old Java score calculation in opt planner but that's 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 far more technical and, and far less flexible than this right okay so um, Thanks for watching, and um, uh, if you want to know more about Autoplanner, just go to the website uh, optoplanner.org.